If this is your first time attending a hump day coffee break, let me just point out the format. The format is pretty straightforward. It's a 15 minute presentation followed by Q&A. And then we're going to finish up by 1130. Everybody goes back to work, grab your coffee, you learn something, you put it to immediate use when you get back to work, and then we can meet next week. So with that, I'm going to introduce Tom Ahern. Okay, so uh, clearly by the sound of that music, you know this is all important. Uh, John asked, pick the three things that matter the most in uh, having a donor newsletter that is effective, welcome, um, enjoyed, and of course, bottom line for us on the fundraising side, profitable. So uh, it forced me to you know, take what I normally have as a list of the 10 uh, biggest factors behind failure, fatal flaws, and reduce it to what are the top three fatal flaws. So um, you can see right here, number one, lousy headlines. Now, lousy headlines, why does that matter? Because uh, newsletters basically march on their headlines. If the headlines are dysfunctional, nothing else works. So, you know, um, suck it up, cupcakes. We have to learn how to write headlines as well as being terrific fundraisers. And fortunately, headlines are, are you know, this is not like uh, a mystery. You can learn it in 10 minutes. Maybe you'll learn it right now, actually. A headline in journalism has a function. The function is to summarize the gist of the story beneath it so that I don't have to read the story beneath it. That's why I can plow through four newspapers every morning in a relatively short amount of time because all of their headlines are written by professionals. Now that means I can look at that headline and I'm like absolutely sure of what the story is about and why it might matter to me. And, and uh, uh, But there is a, well, let, actually, um, let's look at some nonprofit. So go to the next one, John. Uh, this is Save the Children. A few years ago, they came to me and asked me to audit their stuff and help them rebuild their newsletter. And uh, first thing I pointed out was their headlines, um, well, to be blunt, sucked. And uh, the, here's my example I pointed out to them. Um, it is a story about their desire, their ambition, which they will need a lot of donor help with, to double the number of kids that they serve within, at this point, I think it was uh, four years. None of that is in the headline. And that means this headline was you know, built to fail, not built to succeed. So let's go to the next one, John. Um, these are nonprofits, you know, try to be relevant to you guys. Um, this, you know, setting goals for success, uh, it, if you put your hand over the article so you really have no other information except that headline, you, it could go over a hundred, a thousand stories, different stories from anywhere. So it, it again, it just has, it's an, it, it's a broken tool. It does not help me understand anything. And, and frankly, you don't have all that much of my attention span. Um, even though I give you money, if you're going to bore me and you're going to be silly and you're not going to give me a, a good reading experience, then I'm not going to pay any attention to you, which means you get no benefit from this thing you're sending me. And frankly, if you get no benefit, then the likelihood that you're going to retain me as a donor drops severely. Let's go to the next one, John, just so that we, the gallery of mistakes here. From the development department, well, thank you for the warning. And then we'd love to say thank you. Now, we'd love to say thank you, probably I should give that a pass. Because even though it's not a headline, I don't know what the story's about. I do like to be thanked as a donor. So, you know, you can, you can throw in some of those. Let's go to the next one. This one, um, Leahy Clinic. Now, the, uh, the thing is, Leahy was sending this at that point um, to about 100,000 people on a uh, distribution list. I guess most of them, maybe I hope all of them donors. 
And so this comes and you got the photo, you got the big type. The big type is world travelers come home to receive world class care. That's your headline, you get the photo. What those are is eye magnets. In eye motion studies, you, your eye reliably, predictably, involuntarily actually goes right to the biggest splashes of ink, the headline, and the photo. And you can tell from the photo they're playing golf. So I've asked thousands of people now over the years, uh, what do you think this story is about? And the audience, so they're all fundraisers, the audiences will typically say, well, judging from what I can see, they get sick on an overseas golf tour, uh, but couldn't locally get the kind of medicine they needed, sophisticated medicine, and so they had to come back to Leahy Clinic in Boston and get treated. It's an absolutely accurate uh, reading of the, the headline and the photo, the big type and the splash of ink. Uh, but, in fact, this story is about charitable remainder uni trusts, which, you know, some, somebody out in that 100,000 could make good use of, and yet they would never have known that. So, you know, your headline is that moment where you have a chance to bring me in and tell me something, but it ain't going to work if you don't learn to write a, an effective headline. Let's look at what a real headline there you go, Newsweek. Poor, I, you know, RIP Newsweek. I always loved it, but you know, I just couldn't survive in a digital age. And uh, but look at this cover. Look at this cover. You, first of all, you have eye contact, direct eye contact with, with a, a fetching child, perfect child. And is your baby racist? Question mark. Exploring the roots of discrimination. Now, there are two parts to that headline I want to point out, and that's important because usually a good headline in journalism does have two parts. Is your baby racist is the actual headline. It, the headline is the biggest type. The next biggest type, exploring the roots of discrimination, that's called in journalism a deck. Those two things work together. They are not separate units. They are telling a complete story or at least enough of a story to give you an idea of whether you should waste your time on the article or not. Is it of interest to you specifically? I know all of that from that one uh, headline deck combination. It also has the most important word in marketing, the word you. Um, it poses a question which is a, uh, a, a reliable psychological hook in uh, copywriting. Um, it has, uh, it, it's just everything about it is, is perfect. Um, now let's go to the next one, John. And this is a nonprofit which I admire very much. The guy who's the editor, Jeff uh, Hall, is a really, you know, talented uh, writer, loves to surprise me. See, it will the thing about headlines is you're not learning to write headlines in a kind of drudgery way. You're learning to surprise your readers with your headline, which is a big, you know, it's kind of like, think of every headline as a surprise party. What can you do to make me go, oh boy, oh boy, oh wow, that's so amazing. So here, um, this is a map of the state I live in, Rhode Island, and uh, you can see the predicted uh, water uh, levels uh, as the polar ice caps melt, and um, you'll notice that the capital of my state, Providence, is now totally, uh, it's swimming. And, uh, you know, welcome to Atlantis. I, I'm going to have, but I live out in the country, so I'm going to have waterfront property. Learn to swim. You know, it's a great headline. Uh, okay, so that's, that's headlines. We just did headlines. I'm going to continue to reference headlines as we go, but let's keep going. Next of the three worst things is you have crappy content. So um, I look at hundreds, thousands of pieces of donor communications, and I can pretty much guarantee that you, everyone listening, if you haven't, you know, heard, uh, you've gotten the message before, um, taken like a course in newsletters, um, you have crappy content. You don't know, or, or put it another way, you you want positive, you don't have the right content. So let's look at what the right content is. And this is only one slide. And this is from our good buddy, Jeff Brooks. And Jeff, 
um, is notable in the world of nonprofit uh, donor newsletters because his group, the um, domain group in the 1990s, figured out the so-called domain formula for profitable donor newsletters. And this is what is in a domain formula newsletters. First of all, they're trying to get you more involved, tangled up in, uh, interacting with their charity. So you have, you, know, you have things for people to do, all these offers. You can make a planned gift. Oh, if you're a religious charity, you can, you know, pray for something, an advocacy group, write your congressperson, an invitation to events. Uh, oh, by the way, we need hundreds, thousands of don uh, volunteers every year. We'd love to have you come in. That, those are all offers. That's one kind of content. There are only four things you have to do. Another kind of content is so-called stories about donors. What, is, what that is is here's why I made my, why I put a gift in my will for XYZ charity. Um, this is in psychology known as social information. In other words, how did other people behave? Maybe I, I, I'm like them and I'll behave the same way too. Uh, third kind of thing you want in there is thanks to your donors because you're coming to me actually to make me feel good with your donor newsletter. Uh, plus, I, I need to continuously, you know, I want to take pride in the people I give uh, gifts to. So show me that what you're, what is being done with my money is actually mattering to people. And they're saying thank you, in this case, a breast cancer survivor uh, for the Dana-Farber newsletter. And finally, as uh, Jeff was to point out, um, your, your newsletter is taking people on a journey. You cannot do that with statistics. Your statistics, which are the easiest content for most charities to dig up, you know, because they file them all the time to grant funders, um, they don't work with individuals. They're pretty much much useless information, and they take up space that a good story, and a story can be told with just one great photo and a few words of type. So, um, okay. So that's crappy content. Let's go to number three, John, and that is you need to bring to me what I'm calling the gift of joy. You can call it what you want. That's not a technical term. So let's look at the first example of this. The next slide. And I just, you know, I love these people because they are so freaking over the top. They are, you know, not, they have no inhibitions and they're in the entertainment world. So they, they're creating videos and shows and so forth. Uh, uh, it, you know, about the Bible and about, you know, finding and acting, whatever. I'm not, you know, it's not my specialty. But look at this. Look, this is one page of their donor news. <laughs> look what your gift has done. Right there, right at the top. Thanks to you, a young woman found her vocation. And a young man met his confirmation saint. Last year, you helped us. Now, they do have numbers here. Don't worry about it. It's not killing anything. Let's touch even more lives this year. You are my secret weapon. I'm counting on you to produce Tolton this year. Tolton's some kind of you know show. And uh, then you have, oh, right here, why we give. There's the social information that uh, Jeff Brooks refers to. Let's go to the next one, John. I get so excited looking at their, their stuff just because most charities are so timid. They don't, they, they, their goal is to not offend anyone or step on any toes or make any noise. They want to be so quiet. They want to be a little quiet mouse, mice in the corner, and then you'll throw pennies at them. But that, um, that's like anti-marketing. So, you know, just now you know it don't work. Here's, um, here's Houston Grand Opera, and this is a donor newsletter that's uh, been going out for a few years now, built from scratch to do it the right way using the domain formula. I'm just pointing out here the deck, you know, the deck is the part that I care about, uh, you know, deeply as a donor. What did my support help make happen? Oh, look. And then you have the story if I want to read it. But now I, you know, people read these things at 100 miles an hour. And the loneliest place on the planet in a newsletter is paragraph three. Almost nobody's there reading that. They they just read the big type and look at the pictures. And um, and so, you know, your big type is where you're going to make a difference. Next one, John. 
uh, you helped give Grace a voice. This child was born without the ability to speak, and yet now mom hears, I love you, for the first time. Um, I, it, it's hard to overstate uh, how um, well this newsletter did. It, it brought in $50,000 an issue in gifts, additional gifts, way into the black. Uh, and, you know, there, here's why, because the donor gets all the credit. That's what I call the gift of joy. So let me point it out in the next slide. You know, here's the most useless thing in most donor newsletters, the message from the executive director. Nobody reads that crap. They assume it's public relations horseshit. So, but in this case, as the holidays approach, I'm thankful for you in the big type from the ED. That's the gift of joy. And I get that gift of joy within a second. Next one. This is International Crisis Aid. Great group out of St. Louis. And um, the headline tells me right away, your generosity gave a child the gift of life. The big splash of ink is the photo right beneath it. You see the kid, terrible shape, bones, stick figure. If you open up this newsletter, what you see inside, the same child, healthy, uh, like three months later. Who gets the credit? Not the, um, not the organization. I do. As, uh, so I get that gift of joy in the first second. It's right there at the top in clear, easy to read type. Next one. This is the amazing Michelle Brinson. Somebody hire this person away from heart of the mission and triple her salary. Uh, the the um, newsletter that she produces for them with her designer, very nice, uh, brings in more than $2 million in uh, charitable gifts every year. It's 25% of the fundraising budget comes from their newsletter. There's every cover is pretty much the same. You've given this mom and her son hope the gift of joy. I see it right away. Okay, John, let's wrap this baby up. At the Virtuous Circle, you know, you're going to ask me for my help. You're going to thank me for my help. You're going to report to me what you did with my help. That is all you have to do in donor communications. Next slide. But charities care about ask, 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 and the donor actually cares the least about that part. They hate it, actually. Um, what they do like is being feeling good and being thanked and seeing what their, their money is doing out there. So next slide. Your newsletter and your thanks, which together, I think, you know, there's a kind of a unit there, um, are the way you hug your donors. And next slide. So if you don't hug them, what you're going to get is what you're already getting. I can promise you that is uh, seven to eight out of your every ten donors newly acquired will not make a second gift to your charity guaranteed the data is current and the data has stayed like this pretty much forever, uh, at least in the modern age. Let's call it the, the modern digital age. This, we lose them fast. And that is not, well, it's reversible. Anyway, let's see the next one. Uh, <laughs> and if you do reverse that, by the way, this should be your, your focus, uh, you will see a huge jump in your the lifetime value of your current donor list. And of course, the real point, as Roger Craver says, is not to just uh, uh, retain, but to grow that list through better retention. Grow, grow, grow your base. Row, 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 row your base. And uh, there you go. There it is. That's what I have to say. Uh, John wanted me to put up some uh, self-promotional stuff. So you can subscribe to my e-newsletter. You can, uh, you know, uh, buy one of my wonderful books. You can sign up for my direct mail writing uh, camp that starts next week. It's part of uh, Kivi LaRue Miller's nonprofit marketing guide thing. Okay, John, let's, any questions? Uh, this was amazing. I see one question here, and I have a couple questions myself or, or maybe comments. Um, uh, so uh, Alyssa is asking, and first of all, Tom, thank you so much. By the way, everybody here should at least at least get um, Tom's book, okay? 
you should at least do that. I'm telling you, everybody has to do that. All right. Um, see, Tom, I can sell you better than you could sell yourself. Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> we can move on now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so Alyssa's uh, asking, um, how do we acknowledge the impact of our donors with um, without uh, alienating our foundation founders? Most of our funds come from foundations. I, I just don't see any difference. I, I, I do, actually, sometimes in annual reports, it surprises me because people will, you know, they'll they'll kind of over detail the their pie chart and show that you know foundations are over here individuals are over there that's all philanthropy mm, yeah. um, and you know foundations are founded by philanthropy so that's all qualifies as philanthropy as long as you're what you're doing here is building what's called a culture of philanthropy which is probably the worst name ever but it all it means is that people understand that um, charity built it and keeps it going. Mm. Now that's well understood certain places like Princeton uh, University is, is notable among uh, American schools because of its the extraordinary success of its uh, establishing that culture of philanthropy, that notion that charity makes it all happen, or it makes a significant part of it happen. And if you break out foundations as if they're kind of like quasi-governmental or something and not philanthropy, then, then really you're, you're not making a very strong case for philanthropic support when in fact you could, uh, because it's the truth. Philanthropy uh, built you, but it happens to be uh, mislabeled in a way under something other than that, um, so that's what, why that's my complete answer, I guess. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, one, I have a couple more questions here. Bethany is asking about frequency. Is frequency an important factor? Monthly versus quarterly newsletters? Yeah, it's a somewhat of a factor. I mean, the uh, Michelle Brinson's uh, Nashville Rescue uh, newsletter, which you can go view online, incidentally. Um, the uh, that goes out monthly. And they, they're not doing that. Uh, it's a, that's a punishing schedule. It really is. And they're not doing a, uh, they're not doing a kind of modest newsletter either. I mean, the, the domain um, group formula is a fairly modest thing. It's a four, you know, eight and a half by 11 pages stuck on an envelope. It's not a huge uh, endeavor, but the Nashville one is. It's big, it's an oversized publication, beautiful photography, great writing, great design, all of it, you know. Um, uh, but it is sent monthly, and the only reason they do that, and follow that punishing schedule, is uh, because they make a ton of money. And, and you can afford a full-time employee doing nothing but this newsletter. Because yeah. it makes a ton of money. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. The, the, the ROI is very straightforward. Charities are bad at investing in stuff. And this is a case where if you wanted to be like Nashville Rescue Mission and get those kinds of results, you'd hire a qualified. And that's a big difference than just mm -hmm. anybody who has an English degree. A qualified journalist slash, you know, publisher. Mm, uh, yeah. A full-time salary, and yeah. a de you'd need a designer, and you'd need a budget, and you know that's where you run up against what? No, we're not going to do yeah. that. The board hates those kinds of.